Testing one, two. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. My name is Alex. I'm with the bookstore. We're delighted you're here with us this evening, and we hope you enjoy tonight's program with local author and historian Todd Neely. Before we begin, <laughs> before we begin, as always, I have some quick housekeeping to go over. First, we're excited to announce the full lineup and schedule for the 11th annual Harrisburg Book Festival this fall. We'll be hosting many, many authors, including events with George Saunders, Steve Inskeep, Peju Cole, Viet Thanh Nguyen, Emily Wilson, and many, many more. The festival will take place from October 18th through 22nd, and the website is now live at hbgbookfest.com. Please take an events flyer as you leave, stay tuned to our social media pages and website, mark your calendars, and we hope to see you again this October. Lastly, tonight, we encourage you to come away with a signed copy of Shades of Brown this evening. Todd will be sticking around afterwards for a book signing and a quick reminder that book sales are the bedrock of sustainability for our free author events, and every purchase helps support the bookstore, our staff, the authors, and the future of our programming. Books are available for purchase up at the cafe. Now it's my honor to introduce our speakers this evening. Our interviewer this evening is Todd Allen. In his current senior leadership role at Messiah, Todd provides focused attention to institution-wide policies and practices that promote inclusive excellence through the pursuit of diversity across the university. He is founder of the Common Ground Project, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching the history of the civil rights movement. For the past 21 years, in partnership with the PNC Foundation, Allen has led the Returning to the Roots of Civil Rights bus tour. He is a frequent lecturer on commemorative practices, public memory, related to the civil rights movement and also teaches in Messiah's communication department. Of course, our featured author this evening is Todd Neely. Todd is a historian and biographer of books and articles about the intersection of civil rights and education, including This is the Rat Speaking, Glenn Killinger, All-American, and Displaced, a Holocaust memoir on the road to a new beginning. A specialist in 19th and 20th century anti-slavery and civil rights history, Neely is also an adjunct professor in the history department at Dickinson College with more than two decades of experience teaching American history and academic writing at urban and rural schools in Pennsylvania. The founder and executive director of the National Institute for Customizing Education, Neely is a sought after curriculum designer whose work includes the K through 12 Nonviolence 365 curriculum for the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change in Atlanta, Georgia. Neely attained a PhD in American Studies from Pennsylvania State University, Harrisburg, where he received the institution's Sue Samuelson Award for Outstanding Academic Achievement. He lives with his family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Of course, the new book that we're here for this evening is titled Shades of Brown. George Yancey writes, quote, in Shades of Brown, Todd Neely once again establishes himself as a skillful and formidable scholar. In this must-read biography, Dr. Neely puts forth original and engaging ideas about Eliot, her groundbreaking exercise, and the deeply problematic Faustian tendency at the very core of racism, xenophobia, and sexism. We're very honored to welcome to host Todd Allen and Todd Neely. So without further ado, please join me in giving them a warm <laughs> round of applause. Well, good evening. Just a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, Todd and I have been friends for the past six years since I moved here to central Pennsylvania. I have texted him, congratulated him about the book. I said, dude, I thought it wasn't coming out till July 2024, and uh, yet here it is. But we have purposely not talked about the book till now, so he has no idea what I'm going to ask him, and uh, I wish I had time to ask him everything that's on the page. But Todd, I don't want to assume that people actually know who Jane Elliott is or know of her significance, not only to the field uh, of education, but I would say to society at large. So I wonder if you could just give us a little snippet of who is Jane Elliott. <coughs> sure. If you don't mind, uh, I want to congratulate Alex. Uh, last May, this was named National Bookstore of the Year. People don't know that. <laughs> so Alex and, and the staff here at Midtown Scholar. Um, also, I have to say this before I answer your question. Um, I'm from Harrisburg. My parents are here. My family's here. Um, brother and sister are here, too. But I think in a couple of days, it's my parents' 47th or 48th anniversary. So there you go. Happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so for those that haven't heard of Jane Elliott before, um, she is well known in education circles. Um, back in 2005, the McGraw-Hill Foundation, which publishes uh, a lot of our textbooks in, in K through 12, particularly social studies books, uh, named her one of the top 30 educators in world history, <laughs> um, the most impactful educators in world history. So people have known about her, they've known about um, this exercise, which we're gonna discuss tonight. Um, and so <coughs> more than 50 years ago, the day after Martin Luther King uh, Jr. was assassinated, April 4th, 1968, she uh, went to school, she taught at Riceville Elementary School. Um, it's in Northern Iowa. <laughs> she had a class of 28 students. Uh, the class and the, the community there in Riceville um, was very monolithic no diversity, uh, and she at this time had, had been a teacher at a couple schools, and she had lived in a few places in Iowa, which included Waterloo, which is uh, one of the more diverse and larger cities in the state of Iowa. And so she had left home and gone back uh, to, to continue her, edu or her teaching. And um, she also s was teaching in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement, which I wanna make sure we come back to later. And so on her mind was how does she talk to her students, she taught third grade at the time, how does she talk to these young children, eight and nine year olds about culture? And she knew they were gonna come to school the next day uh, asking her uh, about the assassination of Dr. King. And so something that she had been thinking about for years, which was dividing her class uh, by the color of their eyes to give them a simulation on discrimination. Um, and so that's what she did. She did a two-day lesson plan, two-day exercise. On day one, uh, she divided her students between blue eyes and brown eyes, um, <coughs> made the blue-eyed students superior at the top of the hierarchy, brown-eyed students at the bottom of the hierarchy, um, created a segregated society within it, uh, moved those who were less than to the back of the classroom, those with blue eyes to the front of the classroom, gave them privileges, underprivileged the brown-eyed students, um, and embolden that kind of discriminatory behavior amongst the blue eyes treatment of the brown eyes. And then, and then that was a Friday, that was a weekend, they come back to school on, on Monday and she flips it um, <laughs> to the students' shock. And what she discovered, which was became her message from there on out, uh, was the now that the brown eyed students were at the top of the social hierarchy, they didn't wanna treat their blue eyed peers the way that they had treated them uh, on that initial day. And so her hypothesis was that um, people behave in a way that they're labeled. And then, so that's one, and the other hypothesis was if you receive that treatment, if you experience that treatment, then you don't want to deliver it to other people. And so that was her objective with the whole thing, which was to give a, uh, a role play, a simulation on discrimination in an environment where these students wouldn't have, have received it uh, uh, another way. And um, you know, the rest becomes history. There's some things that happen that, that make her nationally known, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Why, um, why did she choose eye color? And I've heard you use the phrase role, pe role play, simulation, exercise, and you don't call it anything else. <coughs> well, as an educator, she toyed with ideas. What are other options? Um, a hair color was an option. Um, giving students t-shirts, different color t-shirts was an option. She said height could have been an option as well, but, but at that age, she just kinda, as a teacher, she didn't wanna use height because that just didn't work with elementary students. And so she said she did what Hitler did. She said Hitler gave her the idea for the lesson. Um, and she said that's something that, of all these other options we could choose to, to separate these children, eye color is the only thing that these students can't control. And that becomes part of the teaching point in these, this exercise, which she continued to do with, with students until 1985 or with adults um, for the next 50 years, <coughs> um, which was we discriminate against people based on things that are out of our control. You know, so without being able to simulate skin color, um, she used eye color, which is also something that's you know, influenced by melanin. Prior to beginning your research, what did you know or think you knew uh, about Jane Elliott um, prior to maybe then meeting her for the, for the first time? Yeah, I appreciate this question. <coughs> um, I'm gonna answer it in my own way and I'm gonna work from it. 
So uh, one of the reasons why I, I chose to write about uh, Jane, my first introduction to her was in 1992 when she was on Oprah. And I was, uh, I think, a fr either a freshman in high school or eighth grade. <coughs> and um, I didn't know what to make of it. And I was just being entertained by the whole thing. Um, and then turn the TV to something else, and that was that. And all of a sudden, she shows up speaking uh, more than a decade, maybe two decades ago in Millersville, <coughs> in Lancaster, where I live. And, um, and so I started to read up more about her because um, now at this point I'm teaching and uh, teaching U.S. history, and what she did was in reaction to King's assassination. And so as a teacher, I tried to give students different ways to look at an event. And so I wanted to tie it to education. This is what a teacher did in a small town um, with you know, lacking in diversity, less than 1,000 people, <coughs> and talk about it. And so um, that's where it started. <coughs> However, I chose to write a book about her because um, I like to, to choose people in history that uh, can give me a snapshot. Uh, I, I like to choose individuals, figures in history that give me a snapshot of a time period. And then I can use her to, in this case, to learn more about what's happening in the 1960s and then beyond. Um, and so, and I try to teach that way as well, use individuals to then teach broader movements and, and explain significance and implications of things. Um, but also, when I started writing the book, um, that was uh, a year after the um, racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd, and um, corporations and universities and schools were looking for like diversity training or anti-racist training. And I run an education firm, and we were involved in some of that uh, training, and um, there's a lot of positive to say, there's a lot of negative to say about that. And so I wanted to learn the argument of how this can work, why people don't like it, and then figure out a solution to improve this. And so really what was happening in 2020 and 2021 with the reaction of what these corporations and schools were doing, um, Jane reappeared. And she ended up on Jimmy Fallon about 50 years to the day when she was on you know, the Johnny Carson show, uh, which made her famous. Um, and so I said, there's not a better person to try to understand the current moment in time than Jane Elliott, who's considered by, by a pretty much everybody as the mother of diversity training. She started the whole thing um, back in the 60s, and then uh, I don't know if we'll talk about you know, the early 70s and 80s, but you know, she's still doing that in the 70s and 80s and forming other diversity training leaders on what to do, um, and so like all of that goes back to your, your question about why Jane Elliott. Um, I <coughs> wanted to use her, bi learn more about her personal story and then use her biography to inform myself and others about this moment in history, but then also how to understand what was happening 50 years ago. Well, as you said, you know, being the, um, the mother, I guess you can say, of the DEI movement, particularly in the corporate space, um, and then this resurgence that she's having now, um, I'm a little struck that there hadn't been um, a definitive biography written on her prior to that, and I'm, 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 I'm wondering what's your take on that. Uh, but then also, I mean, tell us a little bit more about why you think she's seeing such a resurgence in this moment. Well, there's two questions there. Make sure I answer both. All right. <coughs> um, there is there weren't there aren't books written about her with the exception of one that came out two or three years ago. I'll circle back to that. Journalists have written about her for fifty five years, <laughs> so she's not difficult to find I in newspapers. And the beauty of today is, I have two young kids, <laughs> and so it's it's not like it used to be for me when I would travel and then sit in libraries and look at microfilm. Now I can sit on my couch with the kids running around me, <laughs> and look at newspapers.com. And with the keyword search function, I can find Jane Elliott in thousands and thousands of newspapers for 55 years. Um, so people have been writing about her forever, but they've all written the same thing. So they add nothing new. <coughs> and then a book came out, um, which was a, a book that was critical to, to Jane a couple years ago by a journalist, by a journalist named Stephen Bloom, professor in Iowa. <coughs> um, which I didn't read while I was writing. 
I don't want that book to influence me at all. So I waited till after I was done writing. I, I, I told you I was reading it. Yeah, I didn't talk to you about it at all. So the uh, um, but with the one book that's been written on Jay, in addition to this one, um, there are different approaches. And so in my case, I'm a historian writing um, objectively without an agenda. And that's a journalist who, journalists, they typically write with an agenda. And so this is not a criticism to Dr. Bloom or anybody. Like, you have every right to write the way that you want to write. Um, but I think what readers need to do is, if they end up picking up a book, that book, to understand, you know, what the agenda of the author is. And I think the unfortunate part of that scholarship is that uh, I think not only is a misconception about Jane made in the in the book, but also the um, it's like every exercise was like what was done in 1968, you know, with with elementary students, and and so everything everybody now that looks at you know either those documentary films or they read about Jane, it, it's all the same story. Whereas she did the exercise over 300 times, and she did it mostly with adults, um, you know, just a few times with elementary kids, you know, when she when it started, and she stopped that. Um, and I don't think that tells the story, her whole story, and so that's what I tried to do. I wanted to tell the complete story so readers can come to the o their own conclusion about Jane, you know, who people love her or they don't. Well, that that actually takes me to to the next question. I didn't ask the second answer okay. the second question. Remind me what it was. See, now you're testing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think why do you think she's seeing such a resurgence in this moment? Well, um, well, because of what happened in 2020. Uh, we're just three years removed from that, and so what happened in 2020 with um, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, people were looking for a voice to help them steer through what was happening in the country at the time. <laughs> um, there was a racial reckoning that happened over the spring and summer of 2020, and then boom, a counter, you know, the pendulum swung back, and I think she now got stuck in the fight. So where it looked like there was progress going to be made in the country regarding racial relations and institutional and structural problems, and she was one of the voices that was going to help fix those across the country, this, this this counter-revolution to that has now created a culture war, and I think what, what has placed her in this moment of time in 2023 is, you know, she is one of the warriors on the left side of the aisle, you know, in this culture war. Jane is not without controversy for some people, or the exercise is not without controversy. What have been some of the um, maybe more controversial reactions to what, what she's done, or our arguments against why, or what she did in the exercise? So her critics uh, say that the exercise traumatizes um, the people that are on the receiving end of the exercise. And so when people are saying that, they're, they're thinking elementary students. Initially, I, I'm willing to bet that's what everybody in the crowd is thinking. Back to those, you know, the Eye of the Storm documentary film or Class Divided. Those are elementary kids. Those are popular films. <coughs> she has other films where she's with college students, and she has other films where she's with adults, but very little people s have seen those. And, and so um, the biggest criticism is that, you know, how dare she put third grade eight and nine-year-olds on the receiving end of this kind of um, venom. You know, she becomes, a, you know, a, a fascist ruler over a classroom, and that behavior is sending a message to those at the top of the hierarchy of here's how you treat people that have been labeled as other. And um, there's a message with that. And that message with that is when you're looking at, like, institutional power or authority figures and what they say about people um, of historically marginalized groups and how they treat people of historically marginalized groups, that emboldens behavior from those that follow them. And so I think her exercise tells that story. So, one, they're saying it's traumatizing. Two, it challenges that status quo in the end. Um, and... Uh, so the the argument is that it's unethical, and classroom teachers shouldn't be doing it. What what does what Jane say about classroom teachers well, so and that she exercise? She, first of all, she loves talking above everybody, anybody, elementary teachers. Um, uh, so she still cherishes that now. <laughs> um, 
she says, well, look, the exercise works. And one of the last questions I asked her right in the book was, um, would you do it again? <coughs> and, um, and then I asked her that question again. I saw her over the summer, and I said, so do you have the same answer? She said, absolutely, I would do it again, um, because she saw the change that it made in kids, the, her children in class, um, the long-term change it made for them, and then, and then she saw changes that it made when she was working with adults as well. So she said, in spite of the criticism that she's received, and she's received some you know, death threats, um, uh, prank calls, letters in the mail, nah, she still does. Um, and uh, in spite of all of it, she said she would do it again because of the impact that it has on people. So one of the contextual things that, um, if you allow me to get in this, I don't know if you have a question that's going to, but one of the contextual things that I think people need to know about her whether you like the exercise or not, is um, the way she was trained as a teacher. So she went to the Iowa State Teachers College, which is today University of Northern Iowa. And the way that they taught their educators, at least in the 40s and 50s, <laughs> um, she was there in 52, um, was John Dewey-esque, meaning that you learn by doing. <laughs> the best way to teach and the best way for children to learn, no matter the level, is experiential learning. You have to do these hands-on projects for, it for things to stick. It can't be where the teacher's gonna stand in front of the classroom and just lecture, 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 give some notes. <coughs> Those children have to be doing something. And so all of her lessons <laughs> were like that, whether she's creating um, uh, a bookstore or store in her classroom or she's baking with the kids or they're going out and building a park out in the community. Everything was hands-on. And so when she was thinking about um, doing this exercise, you know, she was thinking about how do I teach them instead of just verbalizing, well, here's the racial issues, here are the reasons why King was on the street to start with, and here are the reasons why he was assassinated. It was like, how can I simulate that so these children will never forget it? Um, and so that stays with her, and she feels there's no better way to teach kids, you know, so she holds true to that exercise she did. There are some other contextual things. I don't know if right now is the appropriate time for me to explain that. Do you have a, do you want to ask a question that gets into that, or do you just want me to run with this? You can run. Okay, all right. <coughs> so there's typically, I think, f five things that is important contextual history of Jane Elliott. One I just talked about, the way that she was trained as a teacher and then, and then her certain type of learn by doing pedagogy. <coughs> the second is that she was one of the leading um, voices for uh, teaching students who were dyslexic. Uh, she was trained in the Rome Remedial Center, which still exists, is in Rochester, Minnesota, on how to teach a dyslexic child. Back in the 50s, when she started teaching, and then still in the 60s, uh, no teacher, teachers were trained in this, and very few people respected dyslexia as a, as a reading difference, a learning difference. <coughs> and she had a husband and a son who were both dyslexic. And what the school did, which it, at Riceville Elementary, they put all the dyslexic children in her classroom. And so right now, she's working with what you would call marginalized students <laughs> because they have a, dis a di um, difference, a learning difference that people aren't respecting and there aren't services provided for them. And so right there, she's connecting with some, a group of people that's being othered. <coughs> um, third, uh, the fact that she lived in Waterloo. And when she lived in Waterloo, she lived there for eight years and uh, she lived most of that time in the black neighborhood of Waterloo. Her husband, um, uh, Daryl owned a, or she owned a, he was the manager of a grocery store, a national tea um, company, a grocery store. Uh, and so they lived near that. Um, ultimately, they moved out for, for a few years into the suburbs. <laughs> but his store was ultimately boycotted by the NAACP for not hiring employees of color while in the black community. So it was like, here's a white-owned store profiting from black people not giving back to the community. <laughs> and so the NAACP in 1963 boycotted <coughs> the national tea uh, company because they refused to hire workers of color. And it ultimately led to her husband losing the job and then them moving out. <laughs> that was her introduction really to the civil rights movement. It wasn't anything before that. Like I've asked her even like the, the murder of Emmett Till or the, the Montgomery bus boycott, did any of that get you interested in the civil rights struggle? And she said no. <laughs> it was when it became personal to her. And those are two personal things that resonated with her. And that takes me to the fourth context point and that is the, um, the civil rights movement um, just overall. 
And so while she's becoming a teacher, the, the civil rights movement is reaching a peak. And um, it wins. You know, in 1965, through the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, and, and others, you have Jim Crow killed. And another move was started. <laughs> but the civil rights movement is telling teachers, well, they're challenging teachers, what do we do in this moment? <laughs> because, um, and the civil rights movement is long. You know, we, we kind of bookended in the 50s and the 60s, but the civil rights movement's anti-slavery. Before that's the movement even during the Revolutionary War. So it's long. It's a matter of when you want to start it. <laughs> and during Reconstruction after the Civil War, what historians call Reconstruction is the, um, the second founding of the country <laughs> through the 14th Amendment's birthright citizenship um, clause, its equal protection clause, due process clause that are now being incorporated into, this, into the state. That, that deems America its second founding. <laughs> and now we just finished with the civil rights struggle, which was a struggle to end de jure segregation in the South. <laughs> That's now uh, uh, a s another reconstruction. So the first reconstruction of the Civil War. This is a second reconstruction and what would be a third founding. And so um, with the country being founded anew in the 1960s, teachers are challenged on what is our role in this new founding, this third founding, this second reconstruction of the United States. It's just not politicians. It's just not activists. But what do teachers do that's training, you know, the future? And so what she did with the exercise is she, it wasn't new. <laughs> what Jane did, she's not the creator. She doesn't call herself the, the creator of it. <laughs> teachers were already doing things like this. They were already doing classroom simulations. You asked me the question before about what were other options other than ours. <laughs> teachers were doing that. On uh, hair color, um, there was... Uh, in Palo Alto in 1967, a, a, um, a world cultures teacher created a Nazi state in his high school for a week. Um, uh, it, they made it into an Amazon, it's a, it's a documentary film now on Amazon Prime, you can watch it, it's called The Third Wave. <coughs> um, but he turned the school into Nazi Germany. That had happened. And then a couple years before that in Colorado, there was uh, teachers that also did a week-long simulation on, on racism in their school. Um, and so what Jane did was just one of many teachers that were looking for a way to talk to their students about cultural diversity, um, inclusion, uh, and what America is going to look like after now that the civil rights movement has ended. I think you need to take all those context points um, to heart, and then the fifth would be when the assassination happened. Don't you just want to take a class with this guy? <laughs> um, you can clap for that. Knowing Jane as, as we do, uh, I still want to go third grade and say Mrs. Elliot. Okay? But knowing Jane as, as, as we do, this came also, though, at great professional and personal cost to her in some ways. I'm not surprised that she said she you know, would do it all uh, you know, again, but did you get a sense of any kind of loss or regret or just wrestling with so the, the question on regret, no. Okay. <laughs> um, I never got that sense from her. I've talked, I, I, so I interviewed um, Jane twice a week over the summer of 2021. And, um, and then after, hundreds of email exchanges. Mm -hmm. And not once did she express regret <laughs> um, about doing the exercise. Now, what Dr. Allen is, is insinuating here is that, well, <coughs> her family felt the brunt of her work. <coughs> so while Jane is being praised beyond Riceville, in Riceville, <coughs> in northern Iowa, the, the situation is much different, and <coughs> which is pretty standard for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they love you beyond, but they don't like <laughs> you when, <laughs> when you are. <coughs> the, um, the, uh, so her kids... You know, often got in altercations with some of their peers at school. There was a concern that her husband, would, who was now also running businesses um, in northern Iowa, would he go out of business? And so they had conversations about, I don't want people to know that you're my wife, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so those hardships she certainly dealt with, um, really up to the present day. One of the things, so many things I love about the book, um, but you include a series of just thought-provoking quotations from Jane. One of those is, 
She says, I may not be able to change people's attitudes, but I can challenge them. In what way do you envision this book contributing to her mission to challenge people's attitudes? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not often where you write a biography about someone and then they would agree to do an event with you. Um, and so she's expressed to me that that the book is, it allows people to come to any conclusion they want to about her, right? So it's birth to, the book covers the her birth all the way to 2023. <coughs> it's hard to end a book that way. Um, the, uh, uh, Jane's about to turn 90 in, in November. Um, she, uh, The, ask your question one more time. I lost my train of thought. You just keep testing me to <laughs> see if I'm paying attention to me. Um, in what ways do you envision your book helping, the, the helping her to her mission? Yeah. yeah. Well, the title of it is Sage Brown. <laughs> and so what she's done, largely since she stopped doing exercise and when she gives talks, her, her message is we are one race. <laughs> and it's so, so simple. It is like quite literally third grade logic. <laughs> um, and I think what I try to put out in here, uh, in the book, particularly at the end of it, in the uh, epilogue, is, um, you know, this message is being delivered in the middle of uh, one of the most heated culture wars we've had. And the book also covers the other culture wars that we've had. Now, barring the, the reconstruction, because that's not her life, or the 1920s, what was happening in the 20s, but certainly the culture wars of the 50s and the 70s. All that's in here. She was, she was in the middle of that. And, and so what I, the, the conclusion I come to and I ask people to consider, <coughs> so this is me, not her, is both sides say the same thing, <coughs> right? So you have the, you have the uh, ideological left says, well, race is a social construct. Race is fake. It was fake. It was made up to, to privilege some and underprivilege others. And you have the political right, ideological right, saying we are the human race. So both sides are saying the same thing. They're both saying race is fake, but they can't agree on it. Right? So they, they, that's one thing which is it's so unfortunate because I think that message, her message about let's stop using like racial labels. Let's stop saying black and white people and red and brown and yellow, <laughs> um, and let's stop using those racial identifiers. And she offers the idea of changing language. Um, she offers us four simple words, um, melanemic. So instead of white, say melanemic, <laughs> those who lack melanin. <laughs> um, melanotic, those with a little bit more melanin in their, their body, and so their skin is brown. And then melanaceous those with dark skin, those who we ascribe as black. <laughs> and then those who typically identify as mixed race, she says, stop calling yourselves mixed race, call yourself mosaic. Because even if you're saying mixed race, you're still using race. <laughs> and so that's why I say it's such simple logic, and I think it's smart whether you like her or not, you like the exercise or not. Right? You, everyone should like her. It's the exercise. So <laughs> just to be clear there, she's a wonderful person. The, um, but that kind of terminology and that, that scope of the country, the scope of the world, that we are simply just different shades of brown, and why, if we're both saying the same thing in a different way, why can't we see that we're saying the same thing? And we can create a better society that way. Just before we, we open it up to the audience for questions, um, Jane, as you said, will be 90 soon. Um, yay high, right? Don't tell her I said. Her daughter may yeah. have a watch for her. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, feisty as ever, though. She's not to be played with. No. Did you have any kind of fear um, when you first approached her about the idea of doing a biography on her? So what was that initial conversation like? So here, here's, here's how it started. Um, I, through my education firm, I was doing some work with a school in New York with elementary teachers. And I said, I'm going to reach out to, to, I feel like I spoke with Jane once before this. No. Um, so I reached out to her and said, would you be willing to speak to these teachers in New York? 
And she said, oh, I would, I would love to do that. <laughs> and so we did a thing together. And then when it ended, I um, <coughs> shot her an email and said, hey, I just finished a writing project. <laughs> um, I would, no one has ever written your biography. I would love to be the one that, do that does it. She said no. So she shot me down. <laughs> and then she wrote me back about 48 hours later, and she had reconsidered it. I think she read something that bothered her. <laughs> and so she reached back out and said, sure, go ahead and do it. And so we set up the interviews. And this was, r again, right at the end of, of the spring of 2021, the summer, that summer. And so I, I gave her, a, a, here's an outline. Here's what each interview is going to, the topic's going to be. So I wanted to prove myself that I'm serious. And so we had our first talks for all summer long, and it was like business. Um, like you talk, like she, like she would talk about, you know, personal moments and choke up. And as an interviewer, you, s you try to figure out how, to how do you manage that. But there were very little laughs. So over Labor Day weekend, uh, f I had four days off of work. Um, I flew out to Iowa. And, and so I could really break the ice that way so she could physically see me as opposed to a screen. And so I flew out to Iowa and uh, spent four days with her, <laughs> and, um, which was great. And it was a whole new relationship after that. Now she would laugh at me. And, uh, and then I started to bring my, my, my son and my daughter onto the Zoom calls in the beginning to loosen her up too. Um, and so, but on my visit out there, you talk about her being like feisty and the um, – she had cooked dinner, <laughs> and so I go and take my plate over to the, to like clean it, like rinse it off and put it in a dishwasher. And she yelled at me for cleaning the dish. She said, you, you need all that stuff on your plate, so it, it flies around in a dishwasher and, and washes the other dishes. So something as simple as that. I don't know, like that's just her. I think that's just her. I don't think she was being sarcastic or anything. Like she was sincere there. <laughs> yeah, so you would have to get used to that if you need her. Alex, I'll, uh, I'll turn to you so we can give people an opportunity to ask some questions. Realize it's 7.45. <laughs> if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. We'll go here first. Uh, I, they may want it for their recording. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing well. My name is Vivian, and I really appreciate you being here. And um, I think what you've done is uh, phenomenal. And I like the way that you speak as an educator. Um, but my question is, in this day and time, of being up uh, using woke mm -hmm. to say I'm gonna stop it, and also about your book. There's so many people that don't care about <coughs> what you're saying about diversity, and I love that fact about melanin. And if you see what people who have melanations like myself, we wear shirts that say melanin educated. We don't say you know I'm black. I'm gr we use that word that term because for us it's a way of elevating ourselves against people who try to put us down because of that melanin. But that book in itself, um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who will not want that, and they will say, do not put that in a school, do not put it in a college. How are you um, holding up to that? And I thank you, and I thank your parents for, m you know, making you <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, Vivian, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to answer her in a second, but also... Feel free to bring Dr. Allen in this conversation too. Um, the uh, I, I know that the book wouldn't be welcome in a lot of places, um, a lot of schools. Uh, you know, we're talking K through 12 s schools here. I don't really worry about that in bookstores. Um, so I'm not really bothered by that. Nor is that like my objective is objective is not necessarily to get this into the the schools. Though I'd like as many people to read this as possible. If anything, I'd like other people out there that are familiar with the book to take this approach. <laughs> um, the, I think the way to bridge people, the any gap between people, is, is to find what's common between them. And so, like, let's say me and you have an ideological difference um, over some issue, over th this, culture. <laughs> but if I can say to you, hey, my favorite NFL team is the Eagles, it might be your favorite team, and now all of a sudden, you Steelers. and I... Steelers. Well, <laughs> uh, no, yeah, for the record, I, I'm not emotionally attached to any NFL team, just for the record. <laughs> um, the, uh, you find commonalities like that, and that's, that's how I think you can start to do the work, is, is you say, well, 
wow, you're a lot easier to talk to now because you and I actually bonded over our affinity for the Eagles. And so I think a lot of that's how a lot of those talks need, need to take place. And I would wish that school boards would get that kind of training, which they don't, um, particularly in rural and suburban school districts. And it's unfortunate that we found ourselves in an era, but it's not totally new. It's not a novel area. It's just different with social media, <laughs> where school boards are working for a certain faction of people as opposed to serving the word public in public schools. Hi. Um, so, like Dr. Allen mentioned earlier, like Jane Elliott is a very fiery woman, very sure. intense person to speak to. Um, in a lot of her experience, uh, experiments, what was so like impactful was just how she did not let up. Like we watched the Oprah one uh, last week, and it's just even after everyone's aware it's an experiment, it's been revealed. She's still like, oh, those brown-eyed people, they don't, they, when they don't know how to talk. Um, after 2020, a lot of giant corporations started, like, in response to the social movement, making these newer diversity-type trainings. Um, and so with you being so familiar with Jane Elliott's commitment to experiential diversity trainings, and a lot of these sort of very watered-down diversity trainings are, like, they invite Trevor Noah on to talk about his experience in Hollywood as a black man. What would you think a like experiential diversity training would look like with the lens of Jane Elliott's idea of it being like something that they would understand what's happening? Do you want to take assume the role of Jane right here? And is this one of your students? It's one of my mm -hmm. students. So, but so, so she made a, a big error in her framing of the exercise. Do you want to assume the role well, of Jane? So you're calling it an experiment. Uh, oh, I thought you. Were well, you said no. Jane, no, Jane is watching this, so I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm trying to stay on her good side. <laughs> but but as you said, it's an exercise, not an experiment. <laughs> um, it's one of those pieces. Right, right. So uh, you're asking me if diversity training could work, how best could it work? Uh, let me say first, when, when I said earlier tonight that um, Jane became the model of diversity training, the mother, but then the model, she didn't know any of that was going on. So she's not out there, you know, training people in the 70s and 80s on how to do diversity training. People, they see what she did and they try to, to copy it. And then diversity, like nonprofits and some corporations that are now doing diversity training, they come up with their own model. And when it goes poorly, the journalists that write how poorly it goes, it went, blames it on Jane. And she has no idea this is going on. Um, so I wanted to say, your, your question made me think of that. In today's day and age, there is never cookie cutter where one size fits all. For this to work, you have to customize it to wherever you're at, your university or this corporation. It has to be customized to that. So let's just talk corporations. Because when Jane left teaching in 85, she went to go work in the corporate um, world. And, and so what I would say today is, look, there's, there's positives and negatives to, to, to diversity training. The, the negative is that, well, you get in ideological battles and it's, it's a group of people standing in front of a room and they're trying to impose the personal values on other people. I get that. <laughs> I get why people would, would complain about that. <laughs> the positive is, uh, and, well, with that being said, there's one more negative is that what it ultimately then can do is, is actually create a bigger fraction or divisions within the workplace. <laughs> but the positive is that um, the... You can change culture and climate because if you're a corporation and you're committing to that, <laughs> that sends a message to people that then would apply to your company or your business. And so you're trying to recruit a diverse pool in there, and so that means you want to recruit or people that would want to apply for a, a position at your job see that this is a value that you have. And so it's good for that kind of perf performance to, to diversify your, your um, workforce. <laughs> but then what you need to do is customize it not just for your workplace, so don't copy what another business is doing, another school is doing. <laughs> customize it to your workplace and then customize it within a department. And so departments should have their own type of training and it's not even corporate wide <laughs> because how are you gonna get it to fit the actual job that they do? And so I think you need to apply it to their specific jobs um, and then in the end teach, and I don't know if you have a thought on this, but actually teach them things like um, 
uh, we're planning, we're, we're preparing people for when something happens as opposed to wait till something already happened. How do we deal with this as colleagues? So if you can have those conversations, when you, if you have training along those lines, when something happens, here's how we can maintain good morale in the workplace because we're trying to be proactive. I think to those ends, you know, Jane is far from naive. 55 years later, did you think we'd still be having some of these conversations that we're having? So no, in fact, she commonly says, and she had she said this in the 80s and 90s too, that it was unfortunate that people were still calling her to do these trainings. Um, so no, one of the criticisms, and I get this too, is that people that um, uh, don't like diversity training um, argue that uh, these trainers try to stay in business so they want racism to persist. <coughs> um, I get that. Like, I, I see why they're saying that. Um, there, there have been some trainings that have gone wrong and, like, make others look bad. Um, but Jane's one to say, I'd love to be out of business. You know, and she didn't set out to do this. So Jane didn't set out to lead this empathy revolution, which is what ultimately transpired. The media creates Jane Elliott after 1970. And um, she tried to stay as a teacher, and things happened in her school, and all, uh, all of a sudden people started to offer her money, and she said, well, she asked her school, can I go do this training for a couple months? So can I leave for, you know, take unpaid leave, and then come back and still have my job? And they said no. And so that's ultimately why she got into that, that profession. I, I remember one time, there's a question over here. Uh, I remember one time visiting with her. I didn't get yelled at for the dishwasher <laughs> um, thing, but I remember saying to her on the way out, I thanked her for what she, she's been doing, you know, all those years and contributing. And she said, no, I thank you because it's a shame that I get brought in as a consultant and paid for what you experience every day. And people say that you're crying about racism. This is a question over. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. One here, then there. Okay, all right. Um, I actually have a question for Dr. Allen. After you found out that Dr. Neely was making this book, how did you feel? And then after reading it, did you feel? Did your feelings change, or were they the same? I have been a fan of this guy since I moved here uh, in 2017. I read about him uh, in the newspaper. And I have a, a, a colleague like him in Western Pennsylvania who's just an amazing educator doing things at the high school level that, I mean, I did have a teacher like that, but I'm like, man, if we could multiply teachers like this. And so when I read about this course that he was teaching, I, uh, I can't remember if I called or emailed, but I was like, I want to come to your school. And then once I got all the clearances, you know, we've been hanging out ever since. The thing I say about Todd is this dude writes books faster than I can read them, you know? And, uh, I mean, I'm going to ask him at the end, even though I already know what he's working on next. But just amazing. Um, and so this is, this is your, your teacher. You know how amazing he is then. And so when I think about uh, a, a Jane Elliott, and um, she has just got to be so proud of you. Um, because while in some ways it is disappointing that we're still having some of those conversations in 2023 that she was having in 1968, you are the type of educator, though, that she dreamed of coming along. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, so this is more towards you, um, Mr. Neely. Uh, have your personal experiences as teaching has like helped you write during the book or help you sympathize with her ideas and see if you wanted to imp input them in your own classes because you have seen this firsthand in classes or has your more personal experiences yourself you seen helped you influence to write the book and influence your thoughts of it in the situation? So I <coughs> um, appreciate the question. The uh, wh Number one, I have a curriculum to teach. Um, so I do teach that. Uh, two, um, me teaching really didn't have an impact on this book. Uh, I have written a book on my teaching experiences. Now, uh, this is year 23 for me, and uh, in that time, I think as you know, I've split it between 
a rural district and an urban district. In fact, I was in an urban district, then left to a rural district, spent most of my career there, and then have returned to an, to an urban district. And so also growing up um, in this city, right? So I've been informed by a lot of different env uh, environments. My wife is from the countryside. She is from a rural school district. She grew up on a horse farm, and she had a pony. And so that's something I never even thought about <laughs> when I was when I was your, your age. Um, my kids are exposed to things like gymnastics, which I never thought once about when I was your age. Uh, and so I think that expo I've done also done a lot of traveling. And so I, I would say it's a combination of things that have really informed me about the way that I see the world. But one of the things I've always been proactive of, one of the things I've always learned from students, is that everybody else's voice matters a whole ton. And so I've been able as a teacher to listen to students and then to learn from them, and then that has, uh, has influenced the way that I've, I've taught. I coached as well for a long time, and that also influenced the way that I coach. So it's like, it's like ground up for me in the way that I instruct people, whether it's in a classroom or was on a football field. Um, I kind of see what's in front of me. I listen to them, empower those voices, and then I shape things after that. Um, my name is Susan Bailey, and I thank you for being here. And um, I always run into this Dr. Allen over there, and there's always good things happen around her. <laughs> um, what do the children that first went under this experience, have you talked to them? Are they alive? Are they, what did they think about it? Do they feel negative about it or positive? Or what did they learn, and how did their lives turn out? Yeah, I'm glad that question was asked. Um, believe it or not, no one has ever asked me that question. <laughs> um, the, uh, but it's been written about. Um, look, one of the arguments against Jane and the exercise is that it's traumatizing to students. I think there's a lot of teachers in the room tonight, and I think they could tell you that there's a lot of work that's done to establish rapport with students, where you can do stuff like that with them. Um, you know, that's the part, well, if we're doing this today, you're definitely getting parental permission to do something like this today. <laughs> but you still develop rapport with, with your children in the classroom where, you know, sometimes you could say a joke and they're not going to take it personally. Um, or you can do a lesson or you can challenge them. You can push back on something they said because all that's been part of the classroom culture. Um, and so she established that. <laughs> At the same time, you always have students that you can never reach. So you're always going to have students that don't like you. I think most do, some don't. <laughs> um, and that's no different with, with Jane Elliott. And so I talked to a handful of her students, um, not from the 68 year, from the, the group of students that show up in the film, The Eye of the Storm in the class development. I talked to a handful of them. Um, now, they were willing to talk to me, which means that they weren't hurt, scarred by the, by the experience. Um, and they thanked Jane for, for what she did. But then, you know, you even track down former students as well and, and say that they didn't like it or they don't like her. But I don't think they were traumatized by the exercise. And there's, there's a, a sweet moment that no one will know. <laughs> um, if you watch The Eye of the Storm, she is uh, calling a student to the chalkboard to draw a W. And she draws it with her left hand. <laughs> and so in one of the interviews, I said, are you left-handed? And she said, no. I said, so why are you drawing on the chalkboard with your left hand? And she says, well, because the kids are looking at me and they're dyslexic. And if I am doing it with my right hand, they're not going to be able to do it. Uh, so they have to see me with whatever, because uh, um, a lot of her children were left-handed, just so with the dyslexia, many are left-handed. And so she, had, so she would take the time and work on her penmanship, writing left-hand so she could connect with students that way. So that's just one of the things that she did. And people wouldn't know that just by watching the film. We are running out of time, so this will be our last question before I hand it back to you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you so much for this book. I'm a big fan of Jane Elliott's, and, and actually those films like Eye of the Storm and Class Divided, this will show my age a little bit, but back in the 80s when I lived in Chicago, I had a VHS copy of those that I drove around and did conversations with people on race. And the thing that's so striking about her former students, because she does a reunion and it's in the video, is it not only changed them in positive ways, but it changed the way they raised their children, and it impacted the next generation, which is really moving. 
I wanted to ask if any of your conversations with her, if you talked about the current climate in schools and all the pushback on teaching accurate history about race and what things she might have to say about that, and um, if there's any other call to action you might want to give us. Sure, we, um, we talked about that a lot. In fact, uh, she came up with her own um, euphemism uh, for CRT. Uh, she calls it curriculum respecting truth. <laughs> um, we talked about it a, a ton. <coughs> the, uh, and I have my thoughts on, <coughs> on this whole era that we're in as well. So I don't want to go on too long about it uh, because Alex said it's the last question. But um, there's different ways to look at this. Are you, <coughs> just not you in particular, but in general, is someone uh, critiquing the, the way that edu education is um, trying to be more inclusive to a diversifying student body? The last time this was taken, <coughs> uh, these numbers were, were, were uh, uh, collected <coughs> was 20. Uh, 19 and 53 percent of the student body across the country was students of color. <coughs> the teaching staff, though, is 79 percent, which you would say is white or um, melanotic. Uh, melanemic, sorry. <coughs> the, um, so you still have a, pr a predominantly European descent teaching staff, which means if you're in a rural district, that teaching staff is about 99 percent white. If you're in an urban district, that teaching staff is about 65% white. And schools that are um, majority students of color <coughs> in urban schools. With all of that in mind, <laughs> um, there has been movement at the, er at the beginning of the century, in the early 2000s, and again in 2020, to, to make a conscious effort to make curriculum more inclusive. It doesn't mean change the curriculum. It does. It means include more voices and increase the representation, the stories of the people that you're talking about and learning about and studying in your classes. Make sure that's reflective of diversity. Make sure it's reflective of the student body of the country. Make sure it's reflective of the student body in your classroom. <coughs> and so, what I've taken is that in this new era, <coughs> um, we are now battling a, another effort to segregate schools. But it's not separating white students from students of color. That's not where that battle's taking place, it's the curriculum. And while the curriculum is being integrated, there's an effort to try to stop that curriculum from being integrated, to keep that a segregated curriculum, because there's messages by what's being taught. And what a teacher decides to teach says something about what's valued and what's not valued. <coughs> and that's where the fight is. As the student body changes, the teaching staff doesn't, the school board, look at the school board doesn't change as well, and so that's the struggle we're in now. Todd, we've come to the end of this part. Um, now I'm gonna have to call you for like lunch or dinner so I can ask you all the other no, questions yeah, I no didn't get to ask you. Um, but as we close, I wanna know two things, one, what are you working on next, meaning now, because I know there's no next with you, it's now. <laughs> and um, what's, what's one lesson, and maybe you just answered it when you talked about curriculum, that you and or Jane want us to take from this book? Okay. Uh, what I'm working on now is uh, a book on uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, training camp in, in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. Um, not many people know this. I know you visited. I don't know if anyone in here has ever visited or have heard of it. <coughs> um, a couple years ago in 2020, I wrote a short article, about 4,000 words, about the camp. Um, uh, the people at the camp were really great. Uh, they let people go, and they don't really charge anything. They ask for donations, but they don't charge. Um, you couldn't meet better people. And <coughs> um, I have always had it in my mind that, well, like Jane, there has never been a book. There has never been a book about the camp. And so I don't want to write another book about Ali. <coughs> um, I w so it's really a biography of the camp. And so if you know anybody that visited the camp when Ali trained there from 72 to 81, um, reach out to me, okay, if you or if you know somebody. I'm looking to collect stories and pictures. Um, so I have a couple that'll be a couple years down the road. But that's what I'm working on now. <coughs> Just an hour, 15 minutes away from here. Uh, <coughs> 
the lesson, um, I, I, go, I go back to something that was brought up before, which is, you know, what is the thing that could really fix this, this, um, this time period that we're in now, you know, this battle over culture, and school is the epicenter of that. And um, I think two things, <coughs> if you can, maybe three, if you can find the commonalities, even if you're, you know, out with friends at dinner or something, and all of a sudden the p politics comes up, <coughs> always think about, well, these are the things that bonded you, okay, and, and use that to engage the conversation. And at the root is what you're saying is, well, there's really not much differences between all people walking on the earth. Um, uh, we are of the same race. Um, but then also my last point is don't stop talking. So the only way to uh, counterbalance uh, an opposing side is with more speech. And so as, as people are trying to silence speech in some ways, as some states are passing statutes, laws, on curriculum and what can what can be taught and what can't be taught, that's a, that's a whole new ball game, you know, with, with these state mandates. <laughs> if you counter that with more speech, and if you can counter that with more speech, then the pendulum can swing back. So, thanks for coming, everybody. Congratulations, Todd, on the new book. Um, thanks for coming out, everyone. We have books available for purchase up at the cafe, um, and Todd is going to stick around for a book signing uh, right over here. So thanks for coming out, everyone. Have a good night.